Amen. All right, so there in, in the book of Samuel chapter 10, we see the story about how King Saul comes to be anointed and chosen as, as God, what God chose to lead a nation. And some of you know the story of King Saul, how he started out good, but later in his life he really messed a lot of things up. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, about some of the things that Saul did right and some of the things that we can learn from this. Now look at verse number 6. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. In verse 7 he says, And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou shalt do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. So he's saying God's Spirit is going to come upon you, Saul, and you're going to become a new man. Look at verse number 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now Saul's kind of an average man, but he's obedient to the Lord, and God gives him a new heart. He's been anointed. God gives him a new heart. He becomes a new man. And God's power comes upon Saul. And his old friends look at him and they say, Is Saul also among the prophets? You know, last night we had men's preaching night here at the church. We had 15 men that got up, opened the Word of God, proclaimed what it said. They let God's Spirit lead them. And in the power of God's Spirit, they preached just as Saul did here. And I know that if their old friends could see them, they would probably say the same thing. They would say, are y'all also among the prophets? Yeah, right. Hey, are y'all? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, God will give you a new spirit and a new heart if you're willing to follow His leading. That's right. If you're willing to be obedient to the Word of God, it is God's will that we should all preach the Gospel. Yes. That we should all be closer to God's will. And last night, you men that preached, yes, y'all are also among the prophets. And I want to talk about how King Saul started out his life. The right things we, that we can see about him in serving God and obeying. And later, you know, Saul turned around and messed up. He stopped obeying. He did things his own way. He destroyed that ministry that Saul was given. He destroyed his kingdom. He destroyed his own family. So we're not going to really talk about the negative aspects of Saul. We're going to talk about how he started out right. And then we're going to look at some other scriptures about how we as Christians can end our life right. Yeah. How, you know, we don't want to mess up like Saul did or other people in the Bible. And God gives us these scriptures, these stories, as an example, as something we can learn from. So today we're going to learn how to do it right and how to finish your life right for God and strong in the Lord. Now turn back to 1 Samuel 9. We're going to look at, first of all, what is a prophet? It says, Is Saul among the prophets? A lot of times people hear the word prophet, prophesy or prophecy or a prophet and they're not really sure what it's talking about. But I'll tell you plainly, it means to preach. Yeah. It means to say what God has said. Right. It's not always about telling the future. And I want to show you, we're going to define it out of the Bible. 1 Samuel 9, verse 9. It says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. Now, we're not talking about Brother Seer here, all right? He spells it different. He spells it like, like crier, like the town crier, all right? Similar but different. All right, the seer. So God's man sees from God and he delivers it. It says, come, let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. And I love how the Bible defines itself. Yeah. A prophet is someone that sees God's will and they say it, they preach it. Amen. In Nehemiah chapter 6, it tells us, it says, and thou hast appointed prophets to preach of thee in Jerusalem. Right? A prophet's job is to preach the word of God. That's how we know it. And look, in, in Luke 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Hey, that's what we all do every week. He, in the next verse, he says, To preach the acceptable year of our Lord. And that's actually quoting Isaiah 61, where it says, To proclaim 
the acceptable year of our Lord. So a seer is a prophet. A prophet is a preacher, which is just somebody that proclaims God's Word. Yeah. Now that's our job as all believers. Yes. We are yeah. all supposed to do that. Yeah. Philip the Evangelist, it says that he had four daughters. It says they were virgins. And they prophesied. It says they which did prophesy. Now, preaching as a pastor is different than just preaching like pastoring is a position, a biblical role. There are requirements for it. It says you have to be the husband of one wife. Okay, A lady cannot fill the role of a pastor. There's a club over here where they, they party on the weekends. Y'all heard it last night as we were preaching. The, the bass was kicking up. One night I was, we were in here cleaning the church and this lady comes in, red-eyed, smelling of alcohol. What y'all? I'll just see what y'all is about. I hear you do that Saturday thing. Y'all have church on Saturday. I said, well, no man, we don't really have church on Saturday. We go out soul winning on Saturday. We preach the gospel on Saturdays as we've been commanded to do. Oh, y'all do the Sunday thing. Y'all do the Jesus thing, huh? <laughs> yes, we do. We, we do the Jesus thing. Yeah, Jesus yeah, is God. Yeah, right. And she's drunk. And she says, oh, well, no, I'm, I'm, are you the pastor? Because I'm, I'm a pastor too. Oh, really? Where do you go to church? I don't really go to church. My daddy's got a church up. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Get out you, know, you stupid drunk. I ain't got time for that. Get out of here. It's foolishness. Look, God has a place for a woman and it's not to be a pastor. Right. If you're a lady, God wants you to preach nonetheless. Yeah. Right? Ladies have biblical roles and preaching the gospel is one of them. That's right. Yeah. Preaching yeah. to children. Amen. preaching Hey, preaching to their husbands sometimes if you're unequally yoked. So it's not to, to diminish the role of a woman by any means. But prophecy, again, is to preach God's Word, proclaim His will, Make announcements. You think about like the town cry we talk about, right? Making an announcement. Hey guys, you need to know what God said, right? That's the job of a preacher. It is. And it's, you know, it's not always telling the future. It's not always saying, you know, like Jonah, hey God, in 40 days, he's going to come destroy your city. When we go out and say, hey, God said there's a heaven and a hell. And if you don't trust in him, you will end up in hell. That's sort of telling the future, right? right. But prophesying, preaching is always just saying, this is what God said. It's not my opinion. It's God's Word, whether I like it or not. And it's not always popular. It's speaking the truth without making excuses for it. Right. Men, when you preach behind this pulpit, or ladies, when you preach at the door, you don't get up and say, well, I mean, if it's okay with you, I'm going to tell you, I mean, I know yeah. it's not really popular, but Jesus... No, you get up. Hey, right. Jesus spoke with authority, right. and he so did. should we. Amen. If yeah. we're going to be among the prophets, if we're going to be Christians that are obeying God's Word, we should speak with the authority of God Almighty. Yeah, we right. should. Yeah. Now, flip back to 1 to Samuel 10, verse 12. 1 Samuel 10, verse 12. We'll pick up where we left off there. And it says, And one of the same answered and said... But who is their father? Right? This is after they said about Saul. He said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? Now when it says, Who is their father? This is talking about the prophets. Well, Now if you're a preacher of righteousness, if you're a man of God, who's your father? God Almighty. And what they're saying here is, Well, who is their father? They knew that Saul was saved. And they're saying, Well, he has the same father. Right? He's got the same commission. He's got the same orders, and that's to go preach. God was there for the prophets' fathers. They knew it. God was Saul's father. They knew it. And the first thing that Saul did that was right was he trusted in the Lord for the salvation of his soul. He put his faith in Jesus Christ alone to get to heaven. That's the first thing that we can learn from Saul that he did right. If you're not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you will go to hell. That's right. It's true. It's a fact. Whether I like it or not, or whether you like it or not, yeah. you have to accept that. And the Bible is true, and it's, it's going to ring true in your heart, and you can harden your heart if you want, and God may give you over to strange things, but that's your choice. That's why God has given us the choice to choose to believe. Now look at verse... Go back to chapter 9. So if you're saved, if God is your Father... He wants you to trust and obey, right? You've trusted for salvation. Now we need to obey Him, obey His Word. And one of the things that Saul did right was he obeyed his parents. This is a perfect example. Listen up, kids. In, in 1 Samuel 9, verse 3, it says, And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise. Go, seek the asses. All right, so... Saul was told, hey, his dad's missing some animals. He sends Saul to do it. Saul didn't back talk. He didn't, oh, I'm busy, dad. Why are you going to send me? Why don't you send one of your servants? No, he said, Saul, I need you to go, right? 
And this is something we need to learn. If, he, if Saul had disobeyed, if Saul had said, hey, that's below me, he would not have had the blessing of the Lord on his right. life. He would not have been anointed king. In Ephesians 6, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which are the first commandments with promise. Children, do you want God's blessing on your life? Yes. Then you better obey your parents. Yeah, Even right. as, you know, sometimes when you hit that teenage stage, you think, well, I'm smarter than mom and dad. I got it figured out. I see things different than them. And yet God has commanded you to be in subjection, to be in obedience. Right. Right. Just as sometimes a wife will humbly close their mouth when the husband's wrong and let the husband figure that out for himself, God rewards that. Sure. God rewards children that are willing to listen to their parents and obey their parents. This is God's authority structure. And if you rebel against that, you're going to have a lot of problems in life. Yeah. It is the same as witchcraft in the Bible. Do you want God's blessing on your life? It's up to you. Now the next thing, look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6. Saul obeyed wise counsel. Look, it says, And he said unto him, Behold now, there is, so they go looking for the animals. They can't find them. The servant is speaking to him. His servant says, and they said, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God. And he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. So Saul's servant had the wisdom to seek a man of God. And, you know, to go find that word, from God. He had that much wisdom. In Proverbs 1, it says, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. You want to do the right thing. Sometimes it's best that you ask some advice. You bounce this, the ideas off of your friends. And here Saul was presented with an opportunity. Hey, I got an idea. Let's go talk to the man of God. Saul hearkened to the voice of his servant listening to this wise counsel, and he was blessed for it. In Proverbs 20, it says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. You know, great leaders will listen to the wisdom of others. Yeah. They don't get so puffed up in their mind, they think they've got it all figured out. And great leaders will listen to the people, sometimes, that are below them. Sometimes that you would say, well, that's their servant. Why would you listen to your servant? Why would you listen to your employee on how to do something? Hey, God sets people in order. And sometimes God gives you people around you that are for wise counsel. And if you reject that and you say, well, that's below me. I'm not going to ask this guy. I mean, what can he tell me? I'm the boss. You're going to fall. Right. Right? Yeah, Pride comes before a fall. Yep. And sometimes we need to humble ourselves and listen to the wisdom of other people. Yep. Right. Saul did that here and he was blessed of it. He was obedient to the Word of God. So look, in 1 Samuel 9... Look at verse number 10. Saul was obedient to the word of God. It says, Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. So Saul said, Yeah, that's good advice. I'll take that. Let's go. Now look at verse 19. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place. For ye shall eat with me today and tomorrow. I will let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. So here he's confronted with the man of God and Saul obeys what the man of God says. Yeah. He says, you're the man of God. You've got the word of God. Tell me what I need to do. Today, there are too many people that will ask for the advice of what does the Bible say about this? What does it say about my situation with my job? Well, should I, should I drink? Should I get married? Should I get divorced? And then, well, what's it say? That's not really what I wanted to hear. I'm not going to listen to that. God does not bless that. Right. Uh -oh. The Bible was given to us for instruction, and when you reject it, you're going to fall on your own face. That's right. Saul was blessed because when the man of God told him to do something, he said, okay, I'll do it. I yeah. want to find out what God's Word is. Look at verse 27. It says, And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on. So again, he's obeying. He says, yeah, servant, go. The man of God said, go, you need to go. He didn't ask, well, why? I, don't, I need him to do this. Right? No, he said, go. He just sent him on his way. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Saul was patient enough to wait and to hear what the word of God says. And he was not too proud to learn from another man. And look, if Jesus, it was says that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. As Christians, we need to have that same attitude, right? Yeah. We need to humble ourselves 
and obey the Word of God, the instruction of God, the man of God, and the things that God has said. He delivers through preachers. Amen. And like I said last night, our men that were preaching, there were some very important things that we all need to hear. We're here to preach to each other, to provoke each other, to stay on the course. Yeah. There were some great sermons last night. I was really encouraged. Now listen, one other thing about Saul was that he was humble. Saul was a humble man in the beginning. Samuel begins to reveal God's plan for him to become a king, and Saul kind of backed, whoa, me? What are you talking? You know, he, he didn't, he wasn't puffed up and said, Yeah, I know, I deserve to be king. I always knew I was special. I should be, I should be the king. Saul didn't go seeking a kingdom, right? Saul was searching for some farm animals, obeying his father. Yeah. And the Lord gave him a kingdom. That's right. In 1 Peter 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. It says, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. God will exalt you if you're willing to humble yourself. That's right. Right? As Christians, as believers, as people that ought to be preaching the gospel, we don't go out saying, yeah, I'm going to do a... You watch, I'm going to get a... No. You humble yourself. Man, if the Lord, Lord, if you'll just use me. Lord, if you'll provide me that right opportunity, I'll be faithful. Amen. I'll remain humble. I'll stay longer. I'll do what I have to do to try to help others see your word. That's the attitude we need to have. And look at... 1 Samuel 9, verse 21. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribes of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Paul was not puffed up. He was not saying, Yeah, that's right, I deserve it. No. Paul humbled him. What? I'm the, well, I'm the smallest. Man, I'm the least. And these are the things that Jesus tells us. That's the attitude that we ought to have, especially as we go out preaching the Gospel. Look at verse 22. And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them in the parlor and made them to sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. So Samuel puts on this big dinner. He invites all the chiefs of the nation. And then here comes Saul. And what's Saul? No, no, no. I'm, no, no, Saul, sit up front. Saul, you need to come up front and sit up here with these important men. He had to make him sit up there with him. Saul had a good attitude here. right? Because a lot of times as human beings, wow, these are the mayor's here and the commissioner's here and wow, the vice president, I want to go sit with them. We shouldn't have that attitude. We shouldn't respect persons or titles or, or offices. Yeah, that's good. Look, he says in, in Proverbs 25, he says, Put not forth thyself in the presence of a king and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. He's saying it's better if you're called up than you to like put yourself in that place. And then, hey, can you move? Some of the importance here. I need you to move. Wouldn't that be an embarrassment? You know? Look, and turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's better that it be said unto thee, Come up hither. And many people think we're better. You know, a lot of times when you go out preaching the Gospel, you know, I show them, it says there are none righteous. No, not one. Right. Yeah. Righteous means to always do what's right. Yep. To be a perfect person. And I ask her, do you think you're a perfect person? Nobody says yes. No, I'm not perfect. Do you know anybody that thinks they're perfect? Oh yeah, I know some people <laughs> like that. I think they're on Facebook, you know? <laughs> and, and so it's, it, we know a lot of people that get puffed up, you know, and they oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the stuff, you know? That's not the attitude we need to have right. as Christians. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. Yeah. You know how if somebody's a good worker, when another man brags on him? That's right. Right? I used, to, I used to have a computer store, and I remember this guy that came in and he wanted the job. And man, he was telling me, I can do this. And oh man, I can do anything. And he kept saying that. Oh, I can do anything. I can do, I can figure this. I can do that. I said, man, that don't sound right. You know, I said, well, let me give you a one day trial. Like, I'll just let you we'll work side by side and I'll give you some little, and he couldn't do anything. But he, in his mind, oh, I got it all figured out. Oh, I know, I can, I know it all. I know it all. He didn't know nothing. He was worthless. 
But the guy that would come in and say, well, I know a little bit about that. I'm willing to learn. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to work hard. Those are the people that can actually excel. That person that already comes in, I already got it all figured out. They're lying to themselves. They're lying yeah, to you. Sure. They're worthless. Yeah, that's you think point. about how as Christians, sometimes we get puffed up. Well, I know a little bit of Scripture. Well, I got some doctrine down pat, and you don't, man. Boy, I, I got you. No, God won't bless that attitude. No, he, won't. he will not. He's not going to do that. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. In Matthew 19, Jesus said, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and the servant of all, it says. Jesus is telling His disciples in two different places, you're trying to get up to the top, and the only way to do that is to put yourself in the back. There are a couple men in this church when nobody's looking, they're taking the trash out. They're picking our neighbor's trash up out of the backyard. God will bless that. I don't have to tell you who He is. I don't want to tell you who He is. God's going to bless him for just saying, hey, you know what? I'm not doing it to be seen of men. I don't want, hey, I don't want a pat on the back. I just want to do what's right sure, before yeah. God, and God will bless it. Look, St Saul was off to a good start, and you know the rest of the story. He grieved God's Holy Spirit. He started making a lot of mistakes. He ended up ruining things. He ruined his life, his family. A lot of his family members died because of his mistakes. He ended up committing suicide. Saul was surrounded by the enemy, and he chose. He told his armor bearer to put his sword through him. He wouldn't do it. He put his sword in the ground, and it says he fell on it. Right? He stuck it in the ground and he jumps on his own sword, killing himself, committing suicide. What a terrible way to end your life. And, you know, he was saved. Thank God. The Bible's clear about that. He went where Samuel went. He's in heaven now. He, was, he is a saved man of God because of his faith, because of his willingness to believe God and obey the gospel when he heard it while he was younger. But at the end of his life, he really screwed things up. He messed up so much. He destroyed his family. And we need to learn from that not to make those mistakes. And I want to help you by showing you some other Scriptures. And we're going to look at how God's will for all born-again believers is that they would preach the Gospel. This is so important. It's our job to get other people saved. God's not going to come to them in a vision and preach the Gospel to them. It requires us to get over our pride and humble ourselves and open our mouth. That's what God wants. That's how people get saved. And we God will bless us with His Holy Spirit as we're obedient to Him and His Word. That's good. Now, the Bible was written down by men that were filled with God's Holy Spirit, leading them and showing them and telling them what to say. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, it says that the spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. In context, what this is saying is as I get up and prophesy God's Word, what I say has to be subjected to God's Word. Okay, yeah. What I say, if I give my opinion and it contradicts God's Word, I'm wrong. That's right. Okay, yeah. The spirit of the prophets is subject unto the Word of God. These prophets. The prophets that spoke. It says that we have a sure... In 2 Peter, he tells us that we have a more sure word of prophecy. This is after he's telling us about seeing this great vision, right? Yeah. Literally seeing God open up the sky, seeing the light, seeing angels, seeing a miracle. And he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Right. We can trust the things in the Bible yeah. better than we can a vision of God opening the sky. Yeah, that's right. Okay. He goes on and he tells, he says that holy men of God, well, first he says that it's of no private interpretation. So, and this is where all your false prophets go wrong. They'll take one verse out. They'll make their own little interpretation. Yeah. Well, I think it means this. Send money now. You know, they got their own little, <laughs> right. own little way to, trist, to, to twist the Scriptures. And God warns us about that. Yeah. In the rest of that passage, He says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We have the Bible, the oracles of God, the Scriptures, because holy men, they were willing to submit themselves and become holy by obeying God. They opened their mouth as God's Spirit fell upon them and told them what to say. And that's how God works. That's how He makes the Bible. God wants us to teach and preach the Word, and that goes for everyone here that's saved. There are no exceptions. Man, woman, boy, girl, God has given you the ability to learn the Gospel and to preach the Gospel. Yes, sir. And you know He wants you to be a prophet. Are you all among the prophets? Yes. You ought to be if you're not. Look, Moses said, 
would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them. Now, we get the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit when we're saved at the moment that we believe. But the Bible teaches both Old and New Testament that at moments when it's good for God, when it's convenient for God, He will fill you with His Spirit. His Spirit will overcome you. And just as it did with Saul, he begins to prophesy. Saul was already saved. God's Spirit fell upon him. And he began to prophesy mightily so that even the prophets were like, whoa, this guy's one of us. Yeah. His old friends were like, whoa, this guy's changed. All of a sudden, he's preaching with authority. Yeah. The authority of God's Holy Spirit. Look, King David had said the same thing. He said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His Word was in my tongue. Right? All, Saul, all, all King David was doing when he wrote the Psalms was just writing down what God had said. That's right. He wasn't making stuff up for his own pleasure. He wasn't trying to show off how smart he was or how, how he could make songs. He was obeying God. God's Spirit was giving him God's words. We see the same thing in Ezekiel. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak! Right? Ezekiel the prophet was compelled with the same thing. Open your mouth. Speak. And God didn't leave him hanging. He gave him the words yeah, through God's Spirit. In Stephen, Stephen in the New Testament, it says, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit by which he spake. They ended up putting this guy to death. They stoned him with stones and killed him. But they were not able to resist what he said. He was disputing with false prophets. He was preaching the Gospel with such boldness. They hated him so much they wanted to kill him. It's crazy. But that's how God works. That's how God's Spirit works. And Jesus said the same thing. When we go endure tribulation, He had said, It is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. As believers, we ought to be prophets. We do it by being filled with His Spirit. How do we get filled with His Spirit? Obeying His Word. Keeping His commandments. Amen. The Great Commission was to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. He starts out by saying, I charge thee. That's a command, right? I charge thee before God. I'm telling you, and this is God's my witness, you're commanded to preach. He goes on, at, at the appearing the, the judgment of the quick and the dead he goes on we will all stand before God one day and it's your choices that determine where you spend eternity eternity verse 2 he says what's he charging him what's he commanding preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine we need doctrine we need the long suffering of patience to be instant in season. What does that mean? Ready at a moment's notice. Yeah. Ready at all times. In season, out of season. Well, you know, it's not really popular these days to do things the old school way, the old preaching way, right? I don't care. We're going to preach the Bible. That's right. Well, you can't read from the book of Leviticus. You can't talk about what Romans 1 says about the homos and what uh -oh. Jude says about the homos and how Jesus said that, that they could not believe. That's not popular. You're not allowed to say that anymore. Hey, we're going to preach every word of God. Right. We're not going to make excuses for it. We're going to stand on what He says. Amen. And we're going to trust the Lord to bless it. Yeah. Look at verse, verse number 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So this is why we need the doctrine. Because there is spiritual warfare. And the devil has taken captive the minds of the children of this world. He's stolen their minds and their hearts. And when we go out preaching the gospel, there are some people that all they want to do is scoff and laugh. Yeah. Eternity? Psh, come on. I don't believe in fairy tales. Right? We're to preach. Look, he says, the time will come they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The world wants to have somebody tell them what they want to hear. Sure. Right? The world wants somebody to come tickle their ear a little bit. Hey, would you just encourage me and tell me I'm doing a good job and pat me on the back and send me on my way? Well, what if that's not what God wants you to hear? Right? right. right? Why would you say something God doesn't want you to hear? You think about how Sometimes, you know, the homeless people, they end up there because of their decisions. 
they want to do drugs and they want to drink and they don't want to take care of their family and they don't want to work, why should I give them a dollar and say, God bless you? That's right. They're not being blessed by God. They need to obey God to get be, to be blessed by God. Yeah. Hey, I'll preach in the Gospel, yeah. but I'm not going to give a drunk beer money yeah. that goes against God's will. Right. So what is itching ears? When it talks about they, they, want, they have these itching ears. They want someone to just tell them everything's fine. Yeah. Everything's pleasant. Don't worry, there is no judgment. And there are many false prophets gone into, out into the world oh, yeah. that will tell them just that. Oh, yeah. Right? They will send out mailers that, well, what do you want to hear us say? Right. How do you feel about this? We'll give you what you want. Yeah. You want a rock band at church? We'll get a rock band. You like lights and smoke shows? We'll do that too. Yeah. Right? Our world is becoming or I mean surrounded by so-called churches that refuse to preach the gospel. Right. They on. refuse to preach doctrine. Yeah. And instead they act like the world. They're imitating some of the lame Hollywood artists. Yeah, that's they right. just that's all they're doing. They're a bunch of wannabes. Yeah. They're yeah, certainly good. not Christians. Why? Why don't they want to hear the voice of God? Because they want to make merchandise sure. of you. Amen. That's right. That's right. I've seen churches where they literally pass a five-gallon pail, a bucket around, more than one time. Right? And hey, I'm thankful that the Lord is providing for this church. But I've said it before, I'll say it again. I don't want your money. I don't care if you put money in the plate or not. I'm glad I don't have to take up the offering anymore that we have men that do it for me. Because I don't want to look at you and know whether or not you're obeying God's commandment to tithe. I'm concerned with your spiritual growth. If you don't obey God's commandment, you're not going to grow. All right. If you obey God just by coming to church, man, God's already going to bless you. Sure. Blessed is he that readeth and heareth the words of this prophecy. The fact that you're sitting in church and listening to preaching, you've got a blessing of God coming. But now the rest of that verse, it says, and keepeth those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. The end of the world is at hand. There is a judgment coming for your soul. No man knows the end of their life. Right? Boast not thyself of tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring forth. You don't know if you're going to die on the way to lunch today. Are you ready to die? Are you ready to stand before God? And this is what the world doesn't want to hear. If you said this in one of these lame churches, oh man, the people would just walk out in droves. Yeah, they would. And if I say that and I'm offending you now, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. It's the Word of God. I'm not going to make an excuse. Right. And you can walk out in droves. Amen. If it offends you that I talk about money, and I'm not a money part. I mean, I work six days a week just like you. I put my money in the offering plate just like you. I want to see God build an awesome church here where we can all grow for the Lord. Yeah. This is not what the world wants. No, they not. want that teacher that's going to come tickle their ear a little bit. Right. Yep. And there are so many false prophets. You know, and Paul actually <coughs> named the names yeah. of the false prophets. Right. This is something we, that we've gotten away from as Christianity. And I think we need to go back to what the Bible says. Right? You go out soul winning and you always hear people bring up these false prophets. One that I hear a lot is Joel Osteen. I just love Joel Osteen. I mean, he loves everybody, right? He's always got a smile on his face. Hey, let me tell you, I hate Joel Osteen Amen. because he loves everybody's money. He's not preaching the gospel. He's saying, work your way to heaven, and that's a lie. You cannot work your way to heaven. Salvation is a free gift. It's faith alone. It literally calls it a free gift. And he wants to see your works. He wants to see your money more importantly. America needs more prophets to stand up and preach the gospel and not be afraid to say things that might hurt the feelings of others. But there are people that will say, well, you know what? I don't like you talking about Joel Osteen, but you're right. There's a problem there. Right? He's not a Christian. He's a Christian in name only. He wears it like a badge and he takes it off and does all manner of wickedness. Who knows what he does in the dark? Another famous one we hear a lot about is John Hagee. Right? John Hagee. He's always got these prophecy conferences. Hey, the, the world's going to end on September 27th. The blood moons are coming in 2015. It's the end of the world. Uh, what happened to that? He sold millions of books. Right? He made all these predictions. He made movies. He gets paid to come speak at other churches. Where's the end of the world? According to the Bible, he's a false prophet. Right? According to the Bible, he should be put to death. Amen. Now look, I'm not going to pick up stones. But John Hagee is a wicked false prophet. Right. And worse, worse than just his false predictions and the blood moons and all that, he is a liar teaching that the religion of Judaism can be saved 
without Jesus Christ. Right. Now that is wicked. He is building a, a, a empire of political Zionism that directly goes against the Word of God. He is polluting the minds of people about what will happen in the end times. And boy, is he popular for it. Another real famous guy is T.D. Jakes. Who's heard of T.D. Jakes? Out in Texas, I, hear, I heard it a lot more. He has little satellite churches all over the place. And T.D. Jakes is known for preaching a prosperity gospel. And what that means is, send money now. Right? When I was a kid, there was a false prophet on TV. He would literally put his hand, put your hand on the TV. Oh, send me your check. Send money now and God will bless you. That's a lie. Hey, listen. God wants us to be prosperous. God doesn't have a problem with His people having wealth so long as it doesn't take them away from serving Him. Okay? There's nothing wrong with having a decent bank account, driving a nice car or a nice home, but when you turn that into the Gospel, and you say God's will for your life is that you write me a big check and then God's going to bless you, man, that is a lie. Yeah. That is wicked as hell. Yeah, wicked. And T.D. Jakes, he actually denies the Trinity and the Godhead. Yeah. He denies the Trinity and the Godhead. He teaches this oneness Pentecostalism where they say that you have to be physically baptized to be saved, that you have to speak in tongues to be saved, and essentially they take away from the deity of Christ yeah. saying that Jesus is not God. Now look, the Bible talks about the Trinity over and over and over. Yes, Anybody, sir. and he's a modalist or a oneness. He's a total liar. In 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven. Amen. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Right. Hey, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but three are one is. Yeah. Right? And he's focusing on the one. I, I like the three also. Sure. God teaches us something about that. We have to understand it. In Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Was God having a conversation amongst Himself? Yeah, you better believe it. God is a trinity. He has different parts. Yeah. And what T.D. Jakes would teach is, well, it's just one God, and He left heaven and came down as Jesus for a minute, and then He went back to heaven, and then He filled somebody with the Holy Spirit, but God's not in heaven because there's just one. He's, he's got a different mode. Talk about confusing. Talk about a lie. There are so many Scriptures they ignore when they teach this. That's right. And look, when He said, let us make man in our image, and in our likeness, He says in Genesis 1, and in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, it talks about the believer. It says that we have a spirit. Our whole person has a spirit, a soul, and a body. Right. Now all I can see are your bodies. Okay, Your spirit and your soul will last forever somewhere. If you're saved, one day God will give you a new body. But we are a trinity also. Human beings are made in the likeness of God, in His image. We have three parts. A spirit, a soul, and a body. 1 Thessalonians 5. Yes, sir. In Matthew 12, 18, He says, Behold, My Spirit. This is God the Father speaking. Quoting Isaiah. He says, Behold, My, my servant, which was Jesus, whom I have chosen, My beloved, in whom my soul, that's the Father, the soul, is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon Him. Now listen, God has made us in His image. I have a spirit. I have a soul. I have a body. The Father represents the soul. He says, my soul is well pleased with Jesus, the servant. Jesus was the body. And then there's God's Holy Spirit. This is a very simple doctrine. Children should be able to understand this. But yet T.D. Jakes is so blinded by his lust for money, he'll teach anything for profit. Amen. He's a wicked, wicked man. Now look, you're there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse number 4. It says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They don't want to hear... Right? People, they want to turn away their ears from the truth. They would rather turn to a fable. Right. Oh, no, no. I do church right here every Sunday. I turn on Joel. Right, right in between whenever the pregame show goes to commercial, I'll turn on <laughs> Pastor Joel. And I, I give, you know, I'll send a, I'll text him a little, you know, he'll, he'll put my Instagram on there, my Twitter. I mean, these people, this is not church. It's not. Church is an assembly, it's a congregation. Sure. And people in the world today need to be instructed out of the Word of God. Yeah. This is our job as a prophet. Not just to preach the Gospel, but to teach all things as well. Yeah. right? To make disciples follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. Hey, when I'm wrong, when I say something wrong, show me out of the Word of God. 
I will humble myself and correct myself, and we're going to do it God's way. And we all have to have that same attitude. Look, he says, but watch. Verse 5, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now keep your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. When we come back to 2 Timothy 4, we'll be done. That'll be the last place we go. So he says, watch in all things. Our job as preachers is to be careful. To pay attention to what's going on. Right. Watch in our own lives and watch in others. In 1 Peter 4, he says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now listen, God does not want you to be unsober, right? First he's talking about prayer. He says, he says that we need to pray constantly and trust in the Lord, right? This is actually part of our sobriety. As you take a step through your day, as you work, as you drive, you need to constantly trust in the Lord. You need to strengthen your faith and trust in Him more and more. You need to learn that He wants to give you all things and you need to be willing instead of just, oh, I got this. Hey, you know what, Lord? I know you've already given me the ability to do it, but I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to ask you to bless it. I'm going to ask for your help here. I want to get better at praying and asking you because I trust you'll provide everything I need. And if that means sometimes He closes the door and you're like, but God, I wanted that. Hey, there could be a good thing. There could be something much better happening. He says, watch unto prayer. But it also says sober. Sober. That means serious about life. God doesn't want you drunk. God doesn't want you high. God doesn't want you yeah. delusional because of your right. fantasy football. God doesn't want you to spend hours on the internet, on Facebook or YouTube, just going down the rabbit hole. God wants you to be serious about life. God wants you to take things seriously. And anything that takes away this seriousness or this sobriety is a sin, and it's a stumbling block to your growth. Right. You're taking away from your own growth. You're taking away from your own blessing. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Yeah. So when he said watch in all things, he talks about sobriety in several different places in the Bible. Jesus said, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is, re is ready, but the flesh is weak. Jesus again saying, watch, pray, and look out for the temptation. Look out for the desire of your flesh. Our body can keep us from the blessing of God if we're not careful. right? Our flesh can take us down the wrong path and we're not in the Spirit of God. We're not preaching like we ought to. It can keep us from serving God. This is No Shame November. Our goal is to preach the Gospel every day of the month. And when that opportunity comes up, if you're asking the Lord, Lord, give me a chance to talk to somebody. Give me a chance just to try to ask them some questions, preach them the gospel. Man, all of a sudden I got real hungry. What happened, you know? Oh man, hey, it's time to go. I'll do that later, right? Yeah. The devil's going to use your body to tempt you. Sure. The devil's going to use distractions to take away from the importance of the things that we ought to do. Yeah. Jesus warns us and says, watch, pray, and look out for temptation. Yeah. Now look, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says in verse number 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he hath done this deed and might be taken away from you. The Bible teaches that being in fornication, God wants you expelled from the presence. I want you to hear what God's saying here. We as Christians need to be men of God. We as Christians need to obey what God is saying. To have His blessing in our life, if we're sleeping around and we're not married, God will not bless that. Yeah. He warns us about the temptation of the flesh being a stumbling block. It's the opposite of being sober when your mind's thinking about fornication. Right. And look, He's telling us that it's not allowed in the church. He's saying that they should be taken away from you. And all these other popular churches in the world, what do they say? Shacked up with your girlfriend? Come on in. We got a book just for you. It'll tell you how you guys should date forever and never get married. That's wicked. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches a man should marry a woman and they should stay together for life. 
Amen. And you should not get divorced. God calls it divorce adultery. Yep. And look, if you've been divorced, I'm not picking on you. I don't hate you. God forgives sin. But now's the time to make a decision. I'm going to stay in God's will. Amen. I'm going to stay married here on out. I'm going to do it right here on out. And yep. listen, if you're in fornication, according to the Bible here in 1 Corinthians 5, you should be kicked out of the church. I don't want to have to kick anybody out of the church. But God doesn't want fornicators in our midst because it, it's a bad spirit. It's a bad attitude. It's teaching children that marriage is not important. So God's very serious about this in the sobriety. Look, you're, turn to 1 Corinthians 6, the next chapter. And you would say, yeah, but you know... That's just not easy for me. That's not convenient. I mean, it's working out. God's blessed me. I'm under grace, right? I'm not going to suffer for it. But look at what it says in verse 12 here. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. There is forgiveness for all of our sins, praise the Lord, if you're saved, right? But now that we have this forgiveness, should we let sin abound? No, God forbid, the Bible says. Should we just continue in sin? No, God forbid. And it says that we're brought under the power of any. Right? It's saying all things are lawful. This is not teaching it's okay to get drunk, to get high, to sleep around. He's saying if you do, you will be brought under bondage to the, your own desire of your flesh. You are not in God's will. And God will correct you. Yeah, he he will. will chasten you. Yeah. He will not bless those actions. That's right. He's told us what to do. And when you refuse it, God will correct you. Look, he says in the same chapter, the next verse, verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God's will for you is to get married. If you're sleeping around and you're not married, you're against. You're going against God's will. Right. He will reign up on you. Turn to the next chapter, verse seven, chapter seven. You know, and when, or actually, wait, flip back. Go back to verse eighteen. First Corinthians six eighteen. Let's look at this one also. Here's what we ought to do as Christians, both mentally and physically: flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Do you know why one third of our population has an STD? They're sinning against their own body. They're taking something that was meant to be a promise to one person and they're just spreading around to everybody. That's not right. But the Bible says you're defiled when you do that. Look, God forgives. Let's move forward. If I'm stepping on your toes right now, it's because I love you and I want you to make the right decisions moving forward. It's up to you. You can change your life. You don't have to continue in sin. You're not under the bondage. The power of God's Holy Spirit can, can just get you out of there. Amen. But you have to watch. You have to pray. You have to be sober. You have to have a desire to be a prophet of God. To be a man or a woman of God by submitting and obeying His will. And you think about what David, when David was caught in his sin of adultery, when unto Nathan he said, I've sinned against the Lord. Here it says you're sinning against your own body. God's made a promise. If you sleep around, your body will be defiled. He's also saying you're sinning against the Lord. And the Lord, your body belongs to the Lord. Look at verse 19, the next verse. He says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? God sustains your life. He could take it from you like that. If you're saved, there is a sin unto death. He can see you on this course and see that you've hardened your heart and you say, oh, I'm not going to get it right. This is more convenient. I don't really want to get married. I just want to do it my way. God, okay, you're coming home. You're done. You're obviously not going to obey and you're not going to live for me. You're not going to get any more rewards because of your attitude, so let's just go ahead and bring you home. It'd be sad to stand before God. Yeah. Missing opportunities that God has actually designed for you. Right. You're standing there. You have an opportunity to preach the Gospel. And what do you do? Well, I'm hungry. Meats for the belly and belly for the meats. Right? God's going to destroy them. Well, I'm, well, you know, I'm going to go hang out with my girlfriend. God will destroy you. God will destroy you if you continue in sin. And I, you know, I hope it doesn't happen to anybody here. But we have to see. We have to say these things. He says, "Ye are not your own. If you're saved, your body should be the temple of God. You want God's Spirit in your temple? Obey. 
Don't don't lose your sobriety. Don't stop praying. Don't stop trusting God. Flip to verse to chapter number seven here. First Corinthians seven. Look at verse number two. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. That is God's perfect will. Yeah. Look at chapter ten. First Corinthians chapter ten. Verse number 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. For those of you that know the story it's referencing, God literally killed 23,000 people in an instant in one day because they were sleeping around. That is not God's will for His people. No, it's not. And imagine if all the churches around the country that actually have Christians in them there are independent fundamental Baptist churches that say they're, they're traditional, that say they believe in families, and let, they let people that are shacked up in the church, what if all of a sudden God just said, you know what, I'm going to take them all at once. Uh -oh. It'd be more than 23,000. Oh, yeah. A lot more. Look at verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. God is saying there is no temptation, whether it's losing sobriety or sleeping around. That's normal. You're in the body. Hey, Jesus was tempted at all points like as we are, but yet without sin. We've been given God's Holy Spirit to overcome the sin in our body. And he's saying it's common unto man. Your situation is not special. Well, I know you've had a bunch of bad relationships. Therefore, you're going to fornicate for the rest of your life. No! That's not God's will. That is not right. God will correct you for it. Look, he said he's going to make a way to escape. The Bible teaches marriage is honorable. Let's keep it honorable in this church. The Bible teaches that sobriety is righteous. Let's keep a clear mind. Let's be sober and vigilant and paying attention to what's going on around us. Again, in Revelation 1.3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth. There's a blessing if you read God's Word. Yep. And hear the words of the prophecy. There's a blessing if you listen to the preaching from a man of God. Amen. And that keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at him. God also wants you to keep his commandments. Now that you're saved, you understand you don't have to keep His commandments to go to heaven. Thank God, otherwise none of us would go. Right, right. But now that you're saved, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. That's God's will for your life. You know, Jesus said, Blessed are they that hear the Word of God and keep it. In Deuteronomy 11, He says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. You literally, hey, you want, uh, here's your choice in life. Do you want to be blessed or do you want to be cursed? And this is to God's people. He says, a blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. He goes on, he says, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. He says, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He's saying, hey, you know what? My job's done. I was given a task. It was to preach the Word of God while I was alive. It was to keep the commandments. It was to constantly be praying, not just for myself, but for others around me. And I have done these things. I've accomplished it. Look, he says in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Would to God it were said to us, as men of God and women of God that want to be prophets, that want to let it be known that I want to go out preaching the Gospel, I want to be an everyday soul winner, would to God it would be said at the end of my life, I could say, I finished my course. Amen. I didn't stray. I didn't fail like, Saul, like King Saul did. I didn't go searching after witchcraft and being selfish and disobeying God's Word. I humbled myself and said, you know what, I've heard. Now I'm going to keep it so God will bless me. That's right. As Christians, it's our job to preach. As Christians, it's our job to humble ourselves, to obey God, to search for Him out of His Word, 
to pray constantly. We're commanded to preach. If you obey it, you'll be blessed. So I ask you, are you all among the prophets? Yes. Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the awesome stories that you give us here that we can make a practical, spiritual application for today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be different. Be as lights shining in the world. Lord, help us to understand our personal purpose for you and in that you have a ministry for each of us, Lord. And it begins with reading the word and preaching the gospel. And Lord, from there, there's no telling where you'll take us. Lord, I love the fact you've given us a church we can gather together and have men that will preach and teach. And Lord, families that want to serve you. Lord, I thank you for that. And help us today as we go out soul winning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.